Well, good evening, folks. It's really great to have you here tonight with us to celebrate uh, these, uh, these testimonies to God's grace. What, what is it really all about? What, what does baptism illustrate? Well, this South American pastor had a really cool idea. He wanted to illustrate to his congregation the meaning of baptism. So he got in touch with the local undertaker and asked the undertaker to bring several coffins to the church for the baptismal service. And um, before each of the candidates was baptized, uh, he asked them to enter the coffin and he nailed it down. And then he knocked three times on the coffin lid and said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rise up to new life. And they shot out of the coffins. That's the meaning of baptism, new life in Jesus. And yet the perception of so many people today is that Christianity, is that church, is that, is that faith is boring, tedious, predictable. Abraham Lincoln, uh, one of the famous presidents of the U.S., said, if all the people who fell asleep in church on a Sunday were laid out, they would be a lot more comfortable. <laughs> there was a vicar who showed a, a young lad around his church building, and he pointed to the stone memorials in the walls and said, these are all the people who died in the services, of which the little boy said, which service did they die in, the morning or the evening? You see, that's the way that many people uh, perceive Christianity, perceive this thing called faith. It's rather boring and dead. And yet, in the passage that we had read to us just now, there's evidence here that when Jesus comes into someone's life, boy, oh boy, things are set to change. There's a new agenda, there's a fresh start, and Jesus has surprising friends that the religious types can't make sense of. Tony Campolo, the American sociology professor and pastoral counselor uh, to Bill Clinton at one stage, uh, uh, recounts this famous story of the occasion that he was walking down Main Street in Philadelphia and a tramp came towards him holding a cup of coffee in his hand. The man was, was was filthy, dirty. He had a beard down to his waist, and there was rotten food stuck in the beard. And he spotted Campolo, who was dressed in a smart suit, and said, hey, mister, do you want some of my coffee? Well, Campolo really didn't want any of his coffee, but he knew the proper thing to do was to affirm the guy. So he held the cup of coffee, took a sip, and uh, then he gave the, the cup of coffee back. Then Campolo said, I suppose you want something from me now, don't you? And the tramp said, yeah, I want a hug. Campola, thinking about it, thought, well, I was hoping for five pounds. But the man put his arms tightly around the professor and wouldn't let go. And the professor put his arms around the man, and people were passing the street, staring at this odd couple, the tramp and the professor in his suit, locked in this embrace. I repeat that story of Tony Campolo because it seems to me at the very heart of the incident, the paragraphs from the Gospel of Luke that we read just now, we have, we have this same sense of Jesus reaching out to the most surprising individuals. In the story, the guy called Levi. He's the tax collector. He smelt really bad as far as the Jews were concerned. For one, Tax collectors worked for the imperialist occupying forces. For another, they exploited their own people. And for a third, they were in daily contact with Gentiles who were regarded as unclean people. And what do we see? We see Jesus hugging a man who belonged to the underclass of his society, who, a man who was known as a sinner by people. And Jesus didn't just do it on one occasion, he did it on so many occasions. So much so that Jesus got the reputation, as far as the religious authorities were concerned, of being someone who liked to be a friend of sinners. Now, that was not a compliment. That was a criticism. For the religious types of Jesus' day, mixing socially with people like Levi, totally discredited Jesus, who he was and, and what he said. But that didn't stop the Lord Jesus connecting with people like Levi. 
You see, Jesus didn't get alongside these kinds of people in order to kind of like deal with his social conscience. No, they were his friends. He accepted their invitations to parties. He went to their homes. He got to know them, which is precisely where he was when the Pharisees began to interrogate his disciples because the disciples too had got the hugging bug. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? So what is it that Jesus offers as we respond to him in faith? Well, number one, he offers us, as he offered to Levi in the story, a new priority. Did you get the words of Jesus to that tax collector that no one wanted to be associated with? Levi, follow me. Just two words, but they changed Levi's life. A new priority. That's what baptism tells us about. That in the lives of these four people, there is a new priority now. A new priority order. Jesus has called them, follow me. Now the incident with Levi all began at a party. By the road, near the tax collector's booth. And it ended with this night of conversations and laughter and fun. And those two words, follow me, changed everything. Life-changing words. Because we read that Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. You see, that is the scale of Jesus' invitation. That's the power of Jesus' word. That's what people will do when they hear the commanding voice of Jesus, follow me. I want to change your life. I want to give you a new priority. You see, when Jesus Christ calls a man or a woman, that can make a man or a woman give up his job, break a relationship, change a career. It isn't always the case. But at the heart of a conversion to Jesus is this new priority. We're under new management now. That is the sort of difference that Jesus can make. And that's what baptism signifies for these people. When you invite Jesus to your home, as Levi did, he has a habit of taking over your entire life. Now, the Levi story is the seventh in the, in the Gospel of Luke of these life-changing encounters between Jesus and very different individuals. And they all illustrate this single truth, that Jesus Christ is the boss. He's the king. Uh, the seven stories. Jesus is described as the Lord and the king over the demons. He's described as the Lord and King over disease, the Lord and King over nature, the Lord and King over our sins. And now, in Levi's case, he's the Lord over life. Jesus commands the devil to go. Jesus commands disease to retreat. Jesus commands nature to be still. Jesus commands Levi to pack up his job and follow him. Nothing perhaps better demonstrates the authority of Jesus than that. Jesus Christ calls the shots. He claims the right to determine how we live our lives, what we build our values in life on. That's the first thing we learn from the meaning of baptism. It is a new priority. Jesus is now in charge of the lives of these people. Secondly, there is a new principle, sorry, a new prescription in their lives. Jesus offers a cure, a cure. Jesus offers healing medicine as well as careers advice. The logic is obvious. There is the healthy man and there is the sick man and there is the doctor. You see, this was the confusion on the part of the religious people. They couldn't understand why Jesus was investing his time, his life, in folks like Levi. No goods. Tax collectors. Sinners. And Jesus answers these people. It is not the, the healthy who need a doctor, 
but the sick. I, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus has a new prescription for us. It will be a strange doctor who spent all his day with healthy people. It will be a strange doctor who, who never went into a hospital. That's what doctors are there for, to make us better. So Jesus is saying, I mix with sinners because they have a need and I have a prescription for them. I have a cure. Wow. I have a voice. I'm still hearing it. Amazing. Okay. <laughs> This is getting a bit spooky, isn't it, really? <laughs> Shall I stand right back? There. Jesus has a new prescription. He comes to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, one of the great examples of this prescription of Jesus comes in the previous paragraphs in the Gospel of Luke. We didn't read these. Uh, there's a paralyzed man. Who's, who's brought into the presence of Jesus. And before Jesus heals him physically, he says this, friend, your sins are forgiven you. You see, here is Dr. Jesus looking at this guy, and it's obvious what his need is on the outside. He's paralyzed. He wants to walk again. But Dr. Jesus diagnoses something deeper, something more profound. And so he first of all offers him forgiveness of sins. You see, many of us come to Jesus Christ to sort out our lives, I mean, uh, maybe to, to give us a new relationship with someone, uh, to help us pass our exams, uh, uh, to improve our career prospects. But the priority need in my life and yours is first and foremost that we are put right with God. That our sins are forgiven. Being in a right relationship with God is the number one thing on Jesus' prescription for us. We may think it's a whole lot of other stuff. Well, it may well be. But first and foremost, Dr. Jesus diagnoses the real problem. My broken relationship to God. And Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven you. So you see, here's my need. I'm a sinner. And here's Jesus with a powerful cure, forgiveness. But where does my need of forgiveness and Jesus' power to forgive connect with me? At the cross. At the cross, Jesus took the rap for all the wrong stuff I had done. And I take his cure, his forgiveness, his mercy. I think there are two reasons why people don't want to follow Jesus. One, they are frightened of the consequences because Jesus takes command. And secondly, they think he's talking to somebody else. When Jesus says, follow me, or when Jesus says, I have a cure for sinners, we don't think that applies. Because we feel, well, you know, I'm not too bad. I, 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 I'm not so bad. I'm not really a sinner. Uh, maybe I just need to roll my socks up a bit and try a bit harder and, and, and attempt a few more good deeds here and there. But I'm not that bad, am I? You see, the problem is it's fundamental, but we can't see it. Do we think that Jesus would have died on a cross if all it took for us was to pull our socks up? A little boy managed to get a valuable porcelain vase stuck on his head one day while he was playing spaceman. His mother rang her husband at work and asked his advice. What do I do? Sh shall I break the vase? No, don't do that. I had it valued at Sotheby's the other day and it's priceless. Take him to casualty. Well, she ushered the boy to the car, but the car wasn't there. She remembered the car was in for a service. And then the awful truth dawned on her. She'd have to take her boy by public transport to Casualty. What would people think as she got on the bus with a boy who had a vase where his face should be? 
She couldn't work out what to do. And then she had an idea. She would dress her son in his school blazer and put the school cap on top of the vase. Perhaps she thought no one would notice. I think that's a pretty good picture of what we think sometimes about our own lives. Oh, we're not too bad. You know, we just dress our problems up and, and cover up the issue. But, you know, it's profound. Our broken relationship to God is, is profound. We can't, we can't just stick, cover it up, stick something over it. Jesus offers us this new prescription and this new priority. Thirdly, and finally, before we wrap up, Jesus offers us a new principle. A new principle. It's funny how the joy and life that Jesus brings confused the religious authorities of his day. And so they saw his disciples laughing and, and eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, and, and, and they asked the question, why? John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours, they go on eating and drinking. And Jesus answered, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. And then Jesus tells those two parables. The one contains the image of the wine, the new wine in the old wineskins. You see, Jesus is offering us a new principle of living. He's offering us what Jake said at the outset of his little testimony. He's offering us not religion, but relationship. That's what the Pharisees and other religious people of Jesus' day were offering. A, a, a religion based on rules. But Jesus offers a relationship. A new principle of life. And he says, when I come into someone's life, when I take over the, over the controls, things begin to change. There's a fresh start. There's new life. There's hope. There's vitality. There's liberty. There's freedom. And in those circumstances, now is not the time to fast. Now is the time to eat and drink. So this new principle is a new relationship with God. Freedom and forgiveness and purpose in life. We know where we're going. We know who we're living for. All of that Jesus brings into our experience. And he also brings in a new expression. A new expression of life altogether. When Jesus takes up residence in someone's life, his message, his truth, is the new wine of the kingdom. And it tastes good. Because the old traditions and the old ways of doing things cannot be contained when the life of Jesus bursts in, the life of God's Spirit. And this was what was going on in Jesus' day as people were meeting him and having their lives transformed by him. A new expression was bubbling up inside them. And Jesus was redefining how men and women relate to God. And you see, in every age, in every generation, whenever and wherever this good news of Jesus is understood and embraced, as it has been by our four friends tonight, it generates these new, wonderful lives, open to God, full of God's Spirit, confident not in themselves, but in God's grace and in this gift of Forgiveness. You see, when Jesus comes into a person's life, he doesn't patch us up. He does something radically different, which can't be sewn on to the existing fabric of your life and mine. Christianity doesn't simply patch up your life or cover up the holes. It's a brand new way of operating. It's a brand new way of seeing God, it's a brand new way of relating to life. When Jesus bursts in, he gives us new values, new priorities, and a whole new world. And I want to ask you tonight as I close, is that your experience of faith? Or is it an experience of deadness, a mere tradition? Jesus offers us a new start. Rise to your new life in Christ. Let me encourage you.
to hear Jesus' word to you tonight, follow me. And follow him. It's a great adventure. The greatest of your life. You've been liberated, freed, forgiven. And set on that new road of knowing God and loving God and serving others. May God bless our four friends and all of us tonight as we also respond to Jesus the Nazarene. We're going to sing that lovely old hymn as we finish tonight. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. I hope you can stay behind for tea and coffee. Come down from the balcony down to the floor here. We'll be serving tea and coffee to you, and uh, we hope to chat to you afterwards. Let's stand and sing in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. <laughs>